Hey, hello, Wembley. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, everything first. Um, yeah, I thought I'd try and cover that in uh, 30 minutes. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm John Fisher. I'm head of UX at Nemensa. And when I do these kinds of talks, I often try to make it a mixture of something a bit practical, so that those of you who can hopefully try and take something away you can use tomorrow. But also, um, kind of talk about a bit of, often what I talk about is quite philosophical in terms of my workflow, my processes, and therefore what I like to pass on to uh, the team at Nemensa. So, um, talking about you know, developing your style um, and, and the way that you um, approach design projects or user experience design projects, um, you know, I've often very much been one of those people who likes to take a little bit from here and a little bit from there. I do a lot of reading. And um, when I explained this to a colleague, he said, well, you sound a little bit like Bruce Lee. Um, and I thought, well, I can live with that analogy. You know, that's pretty cool. Um, and we were talking, and then he, I, he said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I kind of make the best of the things that I find. And then when I said that, I thought, well, actually, I'm, I'm more like Orinoco, really. Um, but ultimately, uh, that's what I want to talk about today, really, is, is something quite practical, but at the same time, fully acknowledging, I'll be honest, that um, there isn't really much of an original thought in this presentation. What I want to do today is remind many of the people in the audience of lessons that we've forgotten, in my opinion, or, or have real trouble remembering. Often there's a lot of techniques that we use, there's a lot of methods that um, have been of great value. And as, as the industry changes, because it always does, and it's a, tough, it's a tough industry to keep up to date in with, um, you know, we, we, we forget, and it's, it's something I'm quite passionate about. Um, so, you know. Everything old is new again, um, and that's really what I'm getting at here, is, is um, I want to talk about a, a re-emerging theme um, and some very fascinating uh, articles and things that are coming out, which, and that's really questioning um, what should come first. Um, because in my opinion, what should come first, similar to theme to, 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 to Jim's talk, really, um, the trend for structured thinking. And hopefully by the end of the next 25 minutes, I'll have convinced you all of why this is a great thing to do. There's been a real trend. Hey, you know, lean UX, let's grab a Sharpie, let's sketch something. Don't worry about anything else, just draw it, it will happen. Um, but in my opinion, I wouldn't mind a little bit of upfront thinking. Like, you know, we, we can take a moment to think about what it is that we're going to do and, and, and perhaps the problems that we're going to try and solve. But I don't blame us for adopting this. You know, I, don't, you know, I, th I think the, um, the great phrase that Mike used earlier was the, the Montessori's box of post-it notes and, and, and Sharpies. And there is a certain level of fetishization which goes on with that. But you know, there's been this general explosion of UX, responsive design, lean UX, agile working. Um, so why am I so, you know, I'm not surprised really that this theme is coming. Um, and you know, speaking of which, um, I did want to raise the question of what does come first. Um, is it uh, content first? Is it users first? Is it mobile first? Um, I'd like to announce today that I'm going to write a book. I'm calling it Kickoff Meeting First. Um, <laughs> so, um, but in all seriousness, I want to convince you that my belief is that it's structure um, that should come first. And this is an article um, from Mark Bolton written in 2012. And people are using this phrase, content first, an awful lot. Um, and I loved this article because it personified everything that I passionately believed in. And I no one else had written something about it at the time, or at least I hadn't found anything about it. And it's this phrase here, you know, content first. We don't mean, let's just sit on our asses and wait until we've got all the copy handcrafted and delivered to us, because that would be lovely, but it doesn't necessarily always happen. It does mean, though, that we can understand what it is that we're dealing with, the range of content types, the elements, the relationship between them, the entities that I have in the system that I'm designing. And I think everybody would agree there's a definite trend and a theme coming out about the design of systems. Um, and you know, so this article for me is fantastic. If you haven't read it, well, I'm going to share this deck at the end. All of my uh, references are, are um, fully uh, referenced. Yeah, that's my Austin Powers moment. Um, so. Brad Frost, okay, not quite in the same vein, but, but still this trend, this, this awareness that actually we need to start thinking about how things are made up. 
the elements, the constituent components that actually um, belong there. And, you know, this, this atomic design idea that's coming through more and more. This, I read this three weeks ago. This was published uh, on a list apart, and it was one of those articles that you read and you go, bollocks, I wish I'd written that about two weeks earlier. Because it's absolutely amazing, this article. If you haven't read it yet, I think you definitely should. And what they're really getting at here is um, uh, Sophia here uh, was tasked in 2008 with designing the election night uh, solution for CNN. Obviously, this was a very short time scale, very short turnaround. And she absolutely approached the problem from what are the entities in the system that I need to accommodate? I'm going to have states. I'm going to have races. I'm going to have candidates. I'm going to have the results for that particular election for whatever state in the US that we're looking at. I can't recommend this enough. My point is, this is not from 1998. This was written three weeks ago. Has anybody read this book? Came out in August? Audience participation through the roof today. Okay, so uh, this book, fantastic. Modern web design, really, how people are doing it now. What floored me was when I started reading it was the first three chapters are effectively on content modeling, structure. And with a nod to the past, because everything old is new again, um, you know, what I'd like to remind people of here, are those of you who've seen uh, Mike Atherton talk on this before, is Mike still here? Hello. Hello. Um, you know, the BBC were doing this kind of thinking maybe 10 years ago, I think, quite a while. Um, and the point of recognising um, actually what are the entities that, that make up our systems and starting from that point, starting structure first is the basis. So what do I mean by content model? I've been reminded, actually, by somebody that this, this appeared in um, one of the talks earlier. Um, so, brilliant. Um, <laughs> at least there's a bit of a theme happening. Um, this is kind of content strategy 101. I'm, I'm sure some people in the room um, are thinking that, and I know what a content model is, John. My argument here is we knew what these were a long time ago. I don't necessarily see every team and everybody doing it. So just to really drive home the point, uh, you know, this is a content model for Spotify, which, you know, is a very well-loved and revered digital product or service. Um, but if I happen to like Smells Like Team Spirit, like Nirvana, which is a song, I should be able to logically have the relationship to go find Nevermind, the fantastic album that it is, or I should be able to go find out about um, Nirvana, the artist, or go to the alt-rock charts. Okay? But it's not just about content models. It's about content elements. I should point out, I was having a hell of a week this week, um, that week. I don't really know, uh, probably doing my Arctic Explorer phase. Um, but uh, identifying all of the elements that make up those content types. Um, and the point I want to make here is that we're identifying all the pieces, small and large. And the key thing that I like to drive home to my team when we're talking about this kind of work is that effectively you often need to identify the size and power of each individual element because it's often the smallest piece that will have the most powerful effect upon your user experience. Um, I'm a big fan of chess. For those of you who know me, uh, you never shut up about it. Um, but you know, if you're a professional chess player, um, there's a phrase from a guy called Philidor in the 15th century that says, pawns are the soul of chess. Now, a novice wouldn't necessarily always know that because they think, oh, the queen is the biggest piece on the board. Let's just grab the queen and go with it. My analogy here is simply that you know, the simplest piece of metadata could be the most valuable thing you are going to use to enhance the user experience of whatever digital product that it is that you're designing. You know, a nice example, for example, being maybe um, we do some work uh, for the National Trust, and they have um, uh, trails that you can go on. It's not just about visiting, visiting a, a, a big stately home. You can go on a walk. So a useful piece of information when searching and looking for that may be how hard is the walk, how long is the walk, it's only a tiny piece of data structured accordingly, but actually, from a user experience perspective, it's that little nugget that we'll grab and run with. Which ultimately just brings me to the, you know, part, the second part of the title of this talk, which was kind of structural UX thinking, really. And I've just kind of wanted to come home to that after the introduction because um, I just love this diagram. And for me, it really, em this picture, and for me, it, what it really did was emphasize um, that everything comes together as a whole. Yes, we, as designers, we're often thinking in a holistic vision, but ultimately, if you don't understand the smallest elements to the largest elements and their inherent relationships to each other, it isn't going to work. Or worse, it might work, and it will convince you that actually you've made something worthwhile when it's a little bit dodgy. So I want to show you some examples. Um, this is my point about getting a bit practical with it. So uh, 
a content model that we did uh, last year was for the National Trust. And um, uh, the National Trust um, came to us and they said, you know, we want you to spend a bit of time doing uh, an experience framework. And what they meant by that was we've got this plethora of microsites, websites. Everybody who works at a National Trust property, and there's 700 of them in the UK, they allow them to freely make their own microsites and their own uh, user-generated content. Um, so they said, well, we've got all this content, John. What do we do with it? The easy thing to do would have been started with a very vertical taxonomy, top-down approach. Let's make loads of silos. We'll have art, art exhibitions over here, and we'll have, um, you know, we'll have stately homes over here. Um, it's amazing what they've got. You know, if, if, if ever you go to the National Trust's digital team, they have incredibly passionate users. You know, we were once asked to have a discussion around uh, the love of badges and taxonomy for the website for that. And if you've ever had a conversation about how you aggregate badges, um, that is, is not one I was expecting when I went to university. Um, so here, what I'm really getting at is it didn't take us long to formulate a hypothesis that when somebody visits the National Trust website, um, they're effectively focused around place. Absolutely every piece of content that the National Trust uses, we can focus around the theory, the model of place. Want to buy the scones that you had? Want to eat the scones? There's a recipe. But how do I find the recipe? Well, it's at Lan Hydrock. Um, itineraries, trails, activities, events. And this was a hypothesis that we came up with. We modeled it. And this is a screen grab of a dirty prototype that we started to pull together. But my point here being is that ultimately, you can build the entire experience about a single question. Where do you want to go? And as soon as you search, for where you, uh, enter, you, you can enter anything here. We had different levels of Zoom. So you could say Lanhydrox Stately Home, or you could say Cornwall, or you could say Southwest, or a postcode, whatever it may be. We'd figured all that out because we structured it properly. Um, you eventually then are just presented with um, a list of tiles, but not just Stately Homes. You know, it'll show you an important environmental project that you weren't aware of, that you are now know is going on in Cornwall when you're with your family. So, um, just to show you, you know, it didn't necessarily have to be a big siloed, massive um, IA sitemap style thing. Um, this is just part of the prototype. It subsequently evolved, but I hope you're seeing the point that I'm trying to make. Second example I'd like to talk you through is something we did for a fin major financial services uh, contr uh, contributor. Um, unfortunately, I can't tell you who it is, so I've anonymized all of this, he says, hoping that nothing's written on the post-its. Um, so we started the usual cliche, this is my post-it note slide. Um, and we modeled um, engaging with this financial provider. And the task we were specifically asked to do was how do we help novice investors, people completely new to the stock market, understand what to do with their money? So it didn't take us long to come up with this idea that inherently products are at the center. And when I say products, what I mean by that is a financial services product, something like an ISA. Um, and underneath it, we had this incredibly working title, catchy name, SNI Concepts. Now, what that effectively means is savings and investments concepts. So what we were really recognizing early on is that for every product we had, there was another piece of content that was a saving and investment style FAQ guide or whatever you want to call it. Things like bonds and gilts. Who here knows what a bond and gilt is, honestly? Well, you knew you would. Yeah. Um, OK. Um, Another piece of content in the system, testimonials, that classic piece of content that we use to drive decision making. I admit that the filter facets and the comparison bit here are not really content types, but I put them into the model just to help the team understand um, the relationships and the structure. Ultimately, you can do some kind of filtering. I don't know why I'm moving my hand like that, because I don't have anything infrared. Um, uh, you can do some kind of filtering, and ultimately, you will get a product which can have associated guidance for it. The reason I want to talk to you about this is that by doing this level of thinking, it meant we could incredibly simplify the interface. But when we worked with this client initially, they had a big 10 levels across the top kind of website, loads and loads of silos and, 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 and the usual, let's drill down into the content. I've completely anonymized this example, this screenshot, but my point is, because we understood the content model, we could do this lovely uh, natural language style interface because we knew every component in the system, we knew how it was structured, and we knew how we could design it. But just by taking that little bit of time, this was, this was a, a, a sprint-based project. You know, it took us a couple of hours to come up with the content model. You know, we were just talking it through. But this level of thinking, just spending that little bit of time, 
helped us actually radically change what the UI looks like. So, structured level thinking then, content modeling, workflow implications. So, the first, those couple of examples, I hope you can see that it allows you to really change and simplify and come up with what I believe to be more exciting user interfaces. But actually, there's implications for workflow as well. In the past few years, we've spent an awfully long time trying to um, push designers, and I'm, I'm just going to say now, I'm not going to have a semantic debate about what is a designer, um, so let's just use the word design, but um, using designers and getting them talking more to those who are responsible for some of the code, if not getting some kind of crossover, et cetera. But the interesting thing about starting from a structure-first perspective is that actually, if you're talking about these content strategy-style elements, I believe um, it actually means you're talking more to your, to your back-end development department from the start. Um, and this is something I want to drive home because I think in a lot of modern UX, because the explosion and the demand has been so high, not every UX team is necessarily starting from this. And we see this causing problems on projects with our clients where we can see that a UX department has gone away. They've done some lovely sketches. They're beautiful. They're, they're really nice. Um, but unfortunately, they have no resemblance whatsoever to the infrastructure or the data model that the development team are using. So this is... Um, I'm not saying this is a, a, a work, workflow that I've used recently. Uh, and um, basically, we were given a job with a, with a major client, major entertainment client, where uh, we were told to deliver a, a website effectively in, in, in weeks, not months, um, from start to finish. Um, and that website ha was going live with a massive marketing campaign and had certain uh, quarterly sales targets associated with it, which basically meant you've got this length of time, we're not moving that deadline in a month of Sundays. What that meant was, is that they wanted to run their copy production, their interface design, and their back-end development in parallel in, in a matter of weeks. We hit the deadline because we made a content model, because we knew what content we had and how it was structured. And the moment we had that base, we could disseminate it to all three teams. Yes, there's collaboration. We had to keep talking to each other. But the copywriters could run off, and do their thing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, and this is what I'm talking about. If, you know, I don't want to get caught up in terminology today, but what I'm really saying is structural UX thinking. And the kind of tools that you might use for your workflow might be as simple as a good old-fashioned content priority wireframe. Who here, honestly, has heard of a content priority wireframe? Thank you, those at the back. These were around circa 2001, I think, something like that. Um, basically, what is the structure of the page? What is on it? Yeah? What is its purpose? What is... Um, what, what, what are we actually driving to? There's no, there's no querying here about where or what it looks like. Tools like this, I don't know what happened with my screen grab here, but um, obviously they have news -lers. Um But, um, you know, tools like Gather Content have really taken off and, and are really helping teams deliver because they've just basically built around structured content approach. So what are the advantages to uh, this approach? So the first one, in my belief, is that it reduces the snowball effect. And by the snowball effect, what I'm really talking about, and this happens in all teams, whatever project management framework you're using, Agile or Waterfall, but I mean, a good old-fashioned example would have been the classic Waterfall-style project where perhaps client X comes in at the last minute and says, oh, you know what, we've got to change. And, you know, it's okay because the designer can do it in 30 seconds in Photoshop without realizing that he's actually creating four weeks of development effort further down the line. That's what I mean by the snowball effect. But actually, if you've done your level of structural thinking, you're less likely in our experience to end up with a surprise coming through. Yes, you may be moving elements around, but you're not suddenly going, here's an entity in our system, our design solution, that never existed in the first place. Every time you do this initial upfront level of thinking, you nearly always end up with a simple nav. If you don't end up with a simpler navigation, then you've done it wrong. Um, I read a love in that uh, object oriented UX article that did the rounds a few weeks ago. Um, there was a lovely phrase at the bottom of it, and it said, Users go to the content in the page, but your navigation is your fire escape. And I thought, that's a lovely way of thinking about it. Um, 
So you've, I'm not one of those people who adheres to the no navigation brigade. I do believe you inherently need a navigation, but you can simplify it an awful lot. The third advantage comes from a blog post that I wrote earlier in the summer that ended up proving um, quite popular. Um, I was quite surprised because I, I thought it was quite simple. Um, but basically what I call the second task. Now we spend an awful lot of time with our clients talking about um, trying to achieve something with our, with our digital products. So we say we want you to um, uh, increase sales. We want you to achieve this certain behavior. Um, and we, we map out and we journey things and you know, we go, are they coming from, from Google or they're coming from social? Um, and then as soon as they've done the thing on the, on, the, on the product that we've built, we then kind of go, yeah. Well, my point, with the structured first thinking, you can actually, my question is, what happens next? What, maybe we want to do a second thing on the website. And it's our structured level thinking, it's the taxonomies, it's our recognition of the different content types that we have, which ultimately drive that deeper level of engagement. Um, I, I mean, it, I, I'd be really intrigued to know how many people, when, they, when they've modeled something out and go, ah, oh, and then the user's finished what we wanted them to do, how many people actually then go, well, what's the next step? Finally, um, the Lauren Ipsen debate. So, uh, you know, everyone hates Lauren Ipsen, right? Um, but there's a great article by Karen McRain um, called In Defense of Lauren Ipsen. And I'm not saying we should be using it left, right, and center, and there is a time and a place, and, and so on and such forth. But what I'd like to challenge today and maybe ask people is we're building systems in CMSs. So if we're going to insist on having all of the copy crafted and sculpted, perfectly for day one launch, are we not aware that we're then handing it over to a content author who has the power to change the words? You know, so that lovely design that worked perfectly with all that copy suddenly doesn't. It's a, it's a difficult problem, right? But what I'm trying to get at is this, this water analogy is that ultimately, if you've got tight time scales and you've got to deliver in parallel, actually, potentially, your question is more of how big does the container need to be, not what do the words need to be. And finally, the fifth advantage is effectively, um, yeah, there's been a lot of talk in, in recent years about innovation, service design, let's do lots of workshops and, 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 and not do so, evidence, so much evidence work. Um, which is great and fine, you know, but there's, I'd argue there's kind of two streams of, 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 of thought going on at the moment. We either do projects where we start with an awful lot of upfront research and we ascertain what it is that our users need and what the business needs, or we do some kind of innovation workshop. But my point with this is once you've done that, whatever that is, before you then commence your true and proper design exercise, I would argue that you need to be starting with your, with your structure first approach, your content modeling. Just one more thing. Um, well, a few more things, really. Does anybody know what this is? No? No one's seen this recently? This was doing the rounds last week? Okay. It's J.K. Rowling's notepad. This is how she starts every single Harry Potter novel. She's not just sitting down and writing. She's identifying who are the characters. What are the plot twists? What's the relationships between them? How do they go back and forth? What's going to happen? And yeah, it's not signed off by her editor and a client, and then they go to build. You know. But um, my point is, in a similar vein to the, um, Jim's point about looking to other industries, if other areas are doing this, they're starting with a structure first mindset, then actually um, that needs to tell you something because you know, JK Rowling has done pretty well starting from this notepad. Um, I don't know what that photo is, I can't be honest <laughs> with you. <laughs> um, I typed into Google like layered models. Um, <laughs> And I actually double-checked with my team whether that, the shorts were too short, and they were like, no, it's okay, we can go with it. But um, hopefully you're getting my analogy. Um, if people keep saying the word model, you know, mental model, content model, data model, surely that's something that we should pay attention to. Because inherently a model is a structural entity. 
Um, and, you know, we might have different names for them th these things, but, you know, it's been a long, you know, in the 80s, software development teams were thinking in this kind of, what entities do we have? What are the relationships between them? So my point today is, let's not forget that. Let's start from the position of object-orientated UX or, or content modeling. Because I'll tell you now, I've been doing this for about 12, 13 years, and this has revolutionized the way that I've do, I do things in the last two, two or three. Um, and if you're in my team um, every morning, you know, I, I, what do I say to you? you, know, have, you have you done your content model this morning? Um, not quite that patronizing. Um, but um, you get my point. And this is from Kenneth, who I'm a massive fan of. Hopefully, most of you know who he is. Um, but he posted this uh, in 2012. I'm going to read it out for you. Um, As information is torn free of its moorings and people expect services to straddle countless devices, we'll see a rise in the value of good old-fashioned information architecture. Context, structure, content, and metadata have become key issues for every designer. Information architects much maligned over the last five years, can surely allow themselves a wry smile. And I'm not here today to get into job description conversations, but as Mike pointed out earlier, IA has always been there, whether we, whatever we decide to call it. Um, so finally, uh, the phrase that I use constantly with my team uh, in the last few years is um, what's not where as the starting point. What are we dealing with? Not where does it go on the page? Um, and actually, the full quote is, uh, what, not where, um, it's, it's just an interface, get over it, okay? Um, slightly controversial, maybe, but as a starting point, this is where I begin my workflows. Um, thank you.